Hey, good afternoon and welcome to the Riverwood Conservancy's latest Facebook Live presentation. Today we're talking about understanding nature, physical forms and functions. This is part of a three-part series on understanding nature hosted by Dave Taylor. We'll get to physical forms and functions today. We have a couple of other understanding nature Facebook Live presentations coming up uh, later this fall. So be sure to have a look at uh, all the event details on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash your Riverwood. Hope you're doing well, staying safe. My name is Rashid Clark. I'm the Marketing Specialist at the Riverwood Conservancy. Thanks so much for taking some time out of your afternoon to join us today and talk about nature. Uh, just a reminder that as always, because of COVID-19, we have had to limit our events, including cancel our fundraising events from earlier this year. So we would very much appreciate a donation if you're financially capable to keep events like this going and help us come back strong when we can get back into the park in full force, you can make a donation at theriverwoodconservancy.org. Uh, as we go throughout the presentation today, if you have any questions for Dave, please type them into the comment section. We'll get to them as we go along and at the end of the presentation. And a little bit more about Dave Taylor, in case you haven't already heard. He's a wildlife photographer and author of more than 40 books on wildlife and ecology, and has produced educational videos and material about wildlife for school curriculums. He's taught science and geography for over 30 years and nature photography and writing for over 25 years. So Dave, uh, I will turn things over to you. Thank you, Rishi, and welcome to everybody. Uh, today we're gonna to talk about basically reading sign, how to understand nature. We call the, when we first came up with this, we call it a forensic approach to understanding nature. And it's part of some of the courses that we offer at Riverwood for the students that come. So without further ado, I wanna go back to the birth of natural sciences. You know, the whole notion of science grew out of living in nature and wondering what was going around. And for many people, it was very practical Thing. You had to be able to understand nature to get your food, whether you were a Plains Indian hunting bison or a person living in Africa who wanted to go out and protect his cattle against lions and perhaps um, hunt elephant or whatever. Being able to understand that, you had to become a naturalist. You had to begin becoming a scientist and observe things around you. And there are several steps to this. And by this, this course is by no means um, all inclusive. Uh, there's so much more that uh, we could be talking about. So I've had to narrow it down to these three sections and we'll see how they go. So we're gonna take a look at, I hope the slide moves. There we go. Now it moves all at once. We're gonna take a look at color. Uh, <clears throat> Patterns and color in nature are often things that we just take for granted. If we were living 200 years ago, we would have the attitude, largely because we had become disconnected from nature, that birds sang to please us, and the flowers had color to please us, and these were God's creations, and aren't they wonderful, and they're all there for us, and we've been given dominion over them, and blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> Well, as science started to grow and ecology started to grow and we started to get an understanding, we came to ask some questions like, why is it color? Why do we see things differently? Uh, a lot of animals see the world in black and white, like the lower picture here. We see it as the upper picture, but if we were an insect, we would see something vastly different from both of these pictures. Color is giving us clues. Uh, Bear may or may not need to see yellows. A bee probably needs to see the ultraviolet colors. We get some benefit from the yellow. Um, but why do these colors exist? Well, in one way, they're symbols. They're symbols of how the plant has gone through its life. It might be the flowering in the spring that uh, lets insects know that uh, the, their, the tree is producing. It might be uh, clues for birds to come, insects to come. So these flowers and then the various colors all kind of represent things to us. And in general terms, they have a function that is related to the success of the plant or the animal, in this case, plants. It might be to attract a pollinator. It might be 
to visually let things know that this is not a time to be feeding on me. So these plants change as they go along. And it is a riot. And the riot of color varies throughout the seasons. So well, winter when nothing is growing, you don't see much color. In spring, you get certain plants that start to bloom. You get some in summer. You get some in fall. If you go down to Riverwood today, you'll see a lot of jewelweed growing. They are a late flowering, fall flowering plant. And the flowering is, of course, time to their needs. Insects are attracted to these flowers. Flowers have existed since towards the end of the dinosaurs, probably 100 million years ago. Prior to that, there was no color. Apparently dinosaurs and avian dinosaurs and crocodiles and whatever else was alive back then didn't need to see color the way we saw color. Uh, and again, these insects do not see the colors we see. They see it in various hues and ultraviolet. For the butterfly, the color of the flowers can tell a lot of things to it. But its main flower at this time of year, or the main plant it's interested in, isn't the uh, flowering of it. It's the milkweed plant, which have now gone to seed, but they produce this toxic chemical that the monarch butterfly ingests, which makes the monarch butterfly taste just awful. Eventually, these flowers will produce the reproductive seeds. Um, and now we start to see a clue as to why they've been doing this. But why does an apple invest so much energy in producing all that fruit around it? Why put a nut in a hard case? Well, the answer to that has to do with what the plant has evolved to expect, although they really don't think, but their evolved behavior leads to the dispersal of those plants, those seeds. And there are many ways, like the jewelweed. Uh, a lot of people will have fun going down there in a week or two, and they'll see the jewelweed, and they will now have the seed capsules, and they'll touch them, and the seeds will spring out. Well, the jewelweed plant is going to die. It's going to die where it stands. It doesn't grow next year. So its offspring can fall right to the ground. And then they can grow up where their parent plant was. They're not competing with it. Some plants live lives that are longer, like the burr. The burdock is a two-year life cycle. It needs to get its seeds away from it so it's not competing with its youngsters. So it's evolved <clears throat> this particular way of getting them rid of, which you're all familiar with. It hooks on to you. And it was the inspiration for... Um, I was going to say Gore-Tex. Uh, I'll skip, skip that word. You know it, and I'm getting old and forget things. Oh, great. Yeah. Thank you. The uh, dandelion disperses by wind, and many plants disperse by wind, but not all plants do that, partly because their seeds are too big. And so this is where that fruit comes in. The fruit is a trick. So by having red fruit, it tells the cedar waxwing, or the robin, the fruit is ripe, come eat me. So the bird gets the reward. What happens, though, is the seeds do not get eaten. They get passed through the digestive system, where the digestive juices begin the process of weakening the seed shell. And then the bird flies off, and if it's lucky, it doesn't drop that uh, seed on your windshield it'll drop it someplace where that seed will germinate. So these colors are a clue to spreading the offspring, getting them away from mom and dad. Some will fall at the base, for sure, but many will not. And many animals around the world take advantage of this. I, In my new book on bears, I talk about bear gardens. Now, a bear garden literally is where a bear has, um, well, left a little something, something behind. That little something, something is warm, moist, and loaded with seeds. Some scientists, some brilliant scientists, started counting the number of raspberry seeds in bear droppings. And um, it's about 1,500 on average. 
I have no, no idea how many droppings he had to count to come up with that average. If it had been me, I would have guessed. But uh, he did it. Now, as you go around, you will find places where maybe last year there were no blueberries growing and suddenly there's a blueberry patch there. That might be an indication that a black bear has come along. Elephants do the same thing. They carry seeds and disperse, disperse them all over Africa. Before we had national parks and farms that, and cities that blocked the elephants' migration, they were free to move about and they would carry the seeds with them. And so the mixed forest in Africa and the mixed forests here in North America are due in part to animals carrying seeds. Some of our forests were actually probably seeded 10, 12,000 years ago by our own version of elephants, mastodons and mammoths. Monkeys do it. Uh, sugar gliders in uh, Australia do it. Small animals do it, like deer, doikers, uh, antelope. Red squirrels in Europe, squirrels here, they all carry these seeds away. Now, they have remarkable memories. They find most of them, but some they forget or they leave behind in their droppings. So take a look at these two pictures. Why is color relevant to us with food? If you were to look at the picture on the, the lower picture, the black and white one, would you be able to tell what is ripe and what is not ripe? So... A green banana, you don't want to eat. A green apple, well, mostly you don't want to eat. Um, as fruits ripen, they take on a color, and that is a signal to us and to the animal world that that fruit is ripe. If you eat a fruit before it is not ripe, you will get indigestion. It's kind of a way of getting rid of those seeds quicker, unfortunately. Um, and even eating the seeds, I remember in school, people, the teachers would tell us, don't eat the apple seeds because they'll give you an indigestion. I'm not sure that that's 100% true because I've eaten a lot of apple seeds, but I suppose there is a toxin related to the, the shell that might cause you to get the runs. I don't know. But I do know that as fruit ripens, it does signal itself. Now, a banana that starts to go black, that tastes very different than a banana that's yellow. Some of these fruits, when they rot, and they don't look good to us, are actually even better for the animals because they're richer in sugars. So a rotten apple that falls to the ground and starts to decompose, deer will come to those, bear will come to it. Uh, I've been watching beavers grab these apples recently. I didn't think beavers even ate apples. Who knew? But they do. I guess because there's nutrients. This fall silage, the leaves that fall to the ground, you know, they change color and they fall off. When they first hit the ground, that is a bonus for the deer. And you'll see them wandering around eating that those leaves because they have this rich sugar taste as they, they start to decompose. So silage in the fall is very important to animals. Now, when we talk about animals, color is really important, but there's a lot of misconceptions around animals. So the male mallard duck is a brilliantly colored animal, and you've all seen these ducks. The female is not so brilliantly colored. And of course, the answer is, why is she not colored? Well, the answer is, she has to be camouflaged. She has to hide in the in the bush to lay her nests. And they don't necessarily nest very close to water either. So they might be nesting in the forest. We've had uh, mallards nest in the gardens up by the chapel house. Um, and then they'll walk their babies down. So why is the male colorful? Well, the male is colorful to show off. He is advertising by his brilliance that he's mature, he's healthy, he is an adept and strong male, perfect father for your unborn uh, ducklings. And so it seems to work. So the female duck is brown because she hides and we all make sense. And the male is colorful, but there's a cost to being colorful. If you're a col colorful bird, <clears throat> you're more visible. And a lot of birds see color. So a hawk that feeds on cardinals 
is more likely to spot the male cardinal than the female. Um, and that applies wherever you go. So a lot of these birds, as soon as they get through the business of mating, they go into an eclipse phase where they mold out their bright colors and they get rather drab. The male mallard leaves the female, loses his flight feathers, can't fly anymore, and is a very drab, uninteresting fellow. Now, a lot of people think that all birds are colorful. Well, I would suggest you pick up a field guide sometime and take a look at it. Most birds in the world are not particularly colorful, and they are the most colorful during breeding season. Most are browns or blacks and whites, and that's because it works for them. Um, they may live in flocks, they may have particular breeding grounds, uh, it may help them in their hunting, but by far the vast majority of birds are not particularly colorful. And so you have people like our sponsor Armstrong who produce seed that will attract colorful birds. But if you just put out a normal mix of bird feed and you start looking at the birds that come in, you'll see the chickadees, the sparrows, the juncos. They're going to outnumber just in the number of species, the colorful ones, like the blue jay and the cardinal and the robin. And then some birds use color kind of discreetly. So the male red-winged blackbird flashes his wings, his epaulets, when he's in the mood to mate and he's being territorial. If you look at them when they're not breeding, you don't see that flash of red. It's much smaller. Uh, the uh, red-headed woodpecker uses its color to identify other redheads. Both male and female look the same. There's no difference. Canada geese look the same. Ospreys look the same. And they don't change at all during the season. So if you're out as a naturalist and you're looking and you're trying to decide, is that a male or is that a female Canada goose or osprey? It is very difficult to tell. Size is probably the best thing to look at. Other birds get particularly colorful like the egret during the breeding season, but their color is limited around their eyes. And then to make themselves more visible, they flash feathers. They grow these long, beautiful feathers that um, almost led to their extinction because they were used in women's hats. But that is their breeding plumage. That is their way of saying to the female, I am a handsome male. I'm strutting my stuff. Look at me. Look at me. For the Canada goose, it's not the feather so much. It's his voice. For an osprey, it's the territory he manages to hold on to. But in all cases, color is playing a role. It just isn't the way we think it is. And then some animals are very, very easy to spot. The honeybee, the garden spider, the skunk, even the monarch butterfly to go back to it. Their color is an advertisement. Hey, I'm dangerous. You can see me. I know you can see me, but I am dangerous. So you should stay away from me. I might spray you, sting you, bite you. It's a warning. And we instinctively kind of pick up on that. We kind of know, well, this, this is a bee. It might sting me. Just go out and eat lunch outside today and enjoy the wasps coming around. You will instinctively sort of say, oh, I don't want to deal with that. Some use that color as camouflage. A monarch butterfly cannot hurt a blue jay that grabs it. So in order for the monarch's secret of bright color, it's a toxic taste that it picks up from the plants it eats. A blue jay has to eat at least one. So some poor monarch butterfly is getting sacrificed so that other butterflies can live and the blue jays live and say, well, I'm not having that again. Um, it works. And one species of butterfly, the viceroy, mimics the monarch even though it does not taste bad. One wonders what happens if the blue jay develops a taste for the viceroy before he eats a monarch. Is that going to backfire on the monarch? I don't know. And then some snakes, like this milk snake, mimic more poisonous snakes. So they're bright colors. Although this snake is not dangerous or venomous, 
it looks dangerous and venomous, and that may be enough to save it from being bothered by other predators or people. One of the big questions in nature is, why are zebras striped? And the answers vary from uh, all, well, the most common answer is they're striped for camouflage. But if you've ever been to Africa on safari, one of the easiest animals to spot is a zebra. It's not very well camouflaged. So they said, well, okay, they're not camouflaged, but you get a bunch of zebras running and all those stripes moving together. It's very, very difficult to spot the zebra you want to bring down. Maybe so, but they're still preyed on a fair bit. A more recent theory is by being black and white, it gives them a, an overall uh, cooling pattern to the sun. So they, the black heats, the white doesn't. And there is some validity to that because zebras in South Africa are less striped than zebras on the equator. And we know from ancient rock paintings that the horses that lived in Europe were also striped before we got that got bred out of them. So <clears throat> the pattern of striping seems to have been related to the equator. And that has taken hold and a lot of people buy into it. But researchers recently asked, is there another reason why these animals could be striped? And it turns out that in a way it's kind of a fly repellent. Insects are not as attracted to striped animals as they are to other animals. And I suppose the theory would go that the further north you go, where horses are less striped, there are less insects. I don't know. Nobody's really, really settled the argument, but it goes on and on. And here you can see the pattern from the South, South African zebra which is more lightly striped right up to the uh, Prozowski's horse. I didn't, don't think I said that right, which has very little striping anymore. So we're gonna move from color into structures now. Three structures, all skulls. And you take a look at those things, you know right away which animals are dangerous, which animals are not. Now one is extinct, that's the skull of a dinosaur. The other is an extinct bear. And then there's a hornbill. How those skulls evolved give us clues as to what the animal does. So the two animal skulls, not bird skulls, the reptile and the mammal, those two animals obviously are meat eaters because of their sharp teeth. You can also take a look at the, the lower one, the bear, and you see that it does not have sharp teeth at the back. So those teeth, which are carnicials, are designed for grinding off meat, chewing off meat, but they're also designed for crushing plant material. All of these animals are predators. We would call them carnivores, but true carnivores is actually a, de a designation for certain types of mammals. These are all meat eaters. So the shark, the crocodile, the eagle, and the mongoose are all meat eaters. And they all have fairly sharp teeth or a sharp beak, something to tear with. These are all true carnivores. And these are the families of carnivores. So we have the dog family, which is represented by wolves and bears and badgers and weasels. You have a cat family that includes, surprisingly, besides cats, the spotted hyenas, the mongooses, the raccoon belongs in the dog family, and the two seals, the sea lion and the seal, are all members of the dog family. Now, basically what we're saying here is when the carnivore family evolved many million years ago, it broke into two. There was the cat-like and the dog-like and off they went on their separate paths. And all carnivores fit into that from that original ancestor. And that original ancestor, I'm gonna just hold this up a little bit, had 
the sharp teeth. I'm going to turn this around so you can see them better. And hopefully I'm getting it right. And then they had these carnisial teeth, the back. The carnisial teeth are the teeth that shear meat off of a bone. All of these animals, to one degree or another, have carnisial teeth. Although in the seals, it is less prominent. So here you see in a picture, you can see what we're just talking about. So the canisial are the teeth that are at the back of the jaw. The canines are at the front. Um, they also have premolars and incisors. The incisors chew. These ones, the, the uh, canines, bite, grab, pierce, poke holes in you or their prey. And the other teeth are either the premolars and the carnicials, which are types of molars, are used either to grind or to shear. Now the carnicials themselves, they come down like a pair of scissors like this. So they cut the meat. But if you watch your dog or your cat, it'll get and it'll start to chew on the side. And that's because you can't really chew with these teeth. But these teeth cut it off. The carnicials cut the meat off making it much easier for it to feed. Here's some examples of various predators, and it tells you a little bit about what they're for. I'm gonna skip that one. Of course, if you don't have to eat meat, you don't have to have carnisial teeth. So deer and horses have evolved two different ways of feeding. So you look at their skulls, you notice that the deer do not have top incisors, uh, nor do cattle. There are no bovids. Uh, in fact, you could put your hand in a cow's mouth, as I have done when I worked on the farm, and you're not in any danger of getting bitten. You don't put your hand in a horse's mouth. It'll take it off because it has incisors both top and bottom. Cows have a and deer have a, a very strong plate, um, a, like a leather plate in their mouth that they bite against and they'll tear off things. So if you're looking in the woods for, you see a tree that's been eaten and you see a little tag on it, that's a sign that a deer's eaten it because it is, tears it off because it can't bite it off. If it's a rabbit that's eaten it, it's bitten off. Or a horse, it'll bite. So we can tell a lot from the skulls. You can also tell with these animals that their eye sockets are facing somewhat to the front so they can jump and they can leap but they can also look backwards. Whereas if you look at the skulls of the bear and the wolf, their eye sockets tend to face forward. So they're chasing, they're not worried about what's behind them. This is the skull of a beaver. This is the skull of a beaver, there we go. If you look at its eyes, they're on the top. So it's looking above the water. It can see above and beyond, but it can't see very well below. And it certainly can't jump. So the parasodactyl animals, the odd-toed animals of the world, they tend to have the incisors. They're grass eaters, they're browsers, they bite, and they chew. But they don't have a cut. They don't chew a cut. The aerodactyl, the bovids, the giraffes, these all chew cuts. Now, the hippo is in here. The hippo should not be in here because... Recent DNA studies that have come out since I first worked on this have shown that it is not a member of this family at all. It is actually closely related to the whales. However, it was originally included in this group because of the number of toes. So we're evolving our understanding. And this is our kind of family tree. These are four members of the ape family. Uh, three of them are still in existence. Two of them are still in existence. Two of them are extinct. Our skull is on the far, I'm not sure if it's right or left, the way I'm looking at my screen, but it is the whitish one at one end. Then we have an extinct ape, a gorilla, and then we have an australopithecine, which is a type of hominid. Oh, it's a chimp. So, we can see that these animals are all closely related. So why do we lump them together as being sort of in the hominid family? The gorilla and the chimp are not, but they're closely related to us. And we see the same sort of eyes facing front. But when you look at the teeth, 
The teeth are where the differences come in. We do not have large canine teeth. So, and we do not have sagical crests to pull our jaws up so we can eat plants. So the teeth are a clue as to why the other fellow is considered a human and not an ape. And it has to do with the shape of the jaw. If it's a U-shaped jaw, in order to accommodate those canine teeth, it tends to be a monkey or an ape. If it's a V-shaped jaw, sorry, I got that mistaken. V-shaped is apes, U is humans. And it has to do with those teeth and a different diet. And then we can look at the whole body. The whole body of an animal tells you a lot. If you walk on your toes, and if you're a runner, you know why you run on your toes and walk on your toes. It gives you speed. By putting your toes down, it gives you a little bit more push off than if you're a flat-footed animal. So a wildebeest can outrun a bear, but a bear can still run pretty fast. Let's not kid ourselves. These animals are designed through evolution to fit their particular niche. If it is a large stomach, a really large stomach, you can pretty much be sure that that animal is a plant eater or at least an omnivore with a lot of plant. So a bear, for instance, which is a member of the dog family of predators, carnivores, has a large stomach. And if you've ever seen a bear in the fall, their stomachs almost drag on the ground. That's because they eat a lot of plant material. A wolf, on the other hand, does not eat a lot of plant material. It's much sleeker. Cattle, oryxes, wildebeest, giraffes all have fairly large stomachs because they have to process meat. They have to be able to run predators. They have to, so their eyes are located. You can go through the whole body of an animal, human or otherwise, and take a look at it and understand some of the reasons it evolved the way it does or has. We can also take a look at beaks. Birds' beaks each have a function, even if sometimes the beaks look similar. So a cardinal's beak is designed for breaking seeds. The upside down beak of a flamingo is done, designed to uh, filter out small crustaceans. The hummingbird's beak, I know you're gonna think, well, that's designed to go into plants, and yes, it does. But hummingbirds also eat a lot of insects, which they catch on the fly. The great blue heron, we think of it as a stabbing beak. It actually doesn't stab so much. I, I have seen a few times where it has. But often, as it goes into the water, the beak parts and grabs the fish. But it does streamline it. And then you've got the beak of the uh, bald eagle, which is designed for tearing and for killing. And the beak of the swan, it is designed like a cow's mouth for grazing. Each beak has a certain function. The woodpecker's beak is designed for pecking. Now, it has a further design in its skull that allows it to do that constantly. If a swan or a heron were to try and peck like a woodpecker, it probably wouldn't do it very long because it would be in pain. We can look at the wings of birds. Some birds are soars, and if you look outside today, you're almost certain in Mississauga to see uh, the turkey vultures soaring over. Their wings are broad and wide, and they're designed to lift it up and to float on the air currents as they rise. And you might want to look out, and you'll see several of them flying up. That's called kettling. And they're riding a thermal, and they'll get to the top, and they'll glide down. And they may not flap their wings at all for hours or so. Uh, a swan's wings are designed to take off from the water. They need to be powerful. A hummingbird's wings are designed to rotate quickly. The owl's wings are designed to fly quietly and silently. Different designs of wings have different functions. Even with plants. One of the things that if you when I taught art a little bit, we were looking at plants. If you were drawing a tree, a kid that draws a tree in kindergarten draws a straight line and it's like a rectangle and then the other rectangles come out. 
Take a look at the CN Tower. The CN Tower is modeled the way most trees, not all, but most grow. It wide at the top, then slender at the bottom. So when I was teaching, one of the things we would do is we'd say, all right, kids, let's make a model tree. So we would start piling things up. And if you pile them up bigger, smaller, 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 you would get taller than if you just went big, 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 unless you had some other supporting device. Trees grow that way. Another thing you can do with trees, is take the kids out. If you're looking for teaching ideas, take the kids out in the sun and say, all right, your arms are your branches, your fingers are your leaves. I want you to be a tree. So you grow. And if the sun's all around you, you can grow both sides, no problem. But if the sun is only coming from one direction or you're blocked by shade, then that branch has to grow this way. And then you have them look at trees and you'll see there are patterns. Trees that grow in a farmer's field are often round shaped. Trees that grow in the forest often have branches that go on one side or another, and they are reaching for that sunlight. So understanding structures and shapes helps you. Some plants grow in areas where they don't get the type of material they need, the nutrients, so they have to attract them and catch them themselves. These are pitcher plants, and they capture insects because that's how they're going to get the nutrients because the, the swamps where they grow, the wetlands where they grow, are devoid of a lot of nutrients. So you solve the problem. Anyhow, that's enough for part one. And we'll come back to uh, part two and three as we get on. Well, eventually we're going to end up with one on tracking. And then hopefully we'll get some of you out to, to do some tracking with me at Riverwood. So, Rashid, do we have any questions? Uh, yeah, a couple are coming in. And uh, just a reminder for everyone watching right now, if you do have any questions about anything that we just covered today or any other questions that you may have about uh, reading nature, just drop them into the comment section and we'll get to them right now. Uh, I guess first question in terms of the time of year that we are in right now uh, being fall, is it a good time for us to people or you know, just for people to be out at Riverwood? Uh, what can they sort of look to see that's uh, maybe unique to this time of the season? Or this time of the year, I should say. Uh in terms of, I'll try and keep it related to reading signs, uh, the change in the fall colors is really spectacular. Look for the berries that are starting to come out. And when you look at the berries, don't be surprised if you see cedar waxwings. A cedar waxwing relies on those berries and as food for its young. So it is one of our latest nesting species. It will be nesting late in the summer. So it can come and collect those berries. You won't necessarily see large flocks of cedar waxwings this time of year, but look around the berry trees. You probably won't see robins feeding on berries until a little bit later in the season, but then they will come in and start to feed, and we get some migrants coming through. So the berries are starting to ripen. Look at the forest floor. Listen for deer. This is the time of year, especially once the leaves start to fall, which will be towards the end of October, early November. That's when you'll see deer going through, migrating, not migrating, but moving from one place to another, eating the forest leaves. This is a bounty that is literally for the deer fallen from heaven. Uh, we're getting a lot of migrant birds. The salmon run are going to start coming up. Apparently we had one salmon run already, probably a week ago, um, but they'll be, there'll be other runs. So reading sign, if it pours rain, especially if it pours rain up in Caledon, uh, further north on the Credit River. You want to come down to our place about four or five days later because you're probably going to see the salmon. The salmon right now are out on Lake Ontario. They're circling around. They're waiting for that scent of the river to get washed in, and then they'll come up. It also tells them that the river is deeper and that they can come up further. So uh, look for salmon coming up. Uh, migrant birds, fall colors are beautiful. Our hummingbirds are probably pretty much gone. Monarchs will be migrating through right now. Go to our gardens. They'll be attracted by the flowers um, to feed. It's possible you might see hundreds of uh, monarchs in a day if you start to count. Um, so there's lots going on in Riverwood. Lots going on in your backyard. Lots going down on the lakeshore. Wherever you are, this is a, a great time of year to be out and about, especially in the weather we're having right now. 
Okay, and a question that uh, I think might be coming from uh, a teacher and their class watching. Oh, good. Uh, if you're walking and there's a clear sky, how do you spot birds if you can't see them? So you're walking along, waiting for some birds to appear, and so far, kind of not so successful. Uh, is there a place where you might be able to find them, like treetops, uh, other areas, and um, if you're you know, not being so successful in your in your bird watching? Well, I wish I had a real. That's a really interesting question. Um, and we want a silver bullet answer. Of course. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, many birds fly so high that you can't. You just simply can't see them. They're such little dots. Um, if I were looking for birds, I the blue sky throws me. Um, I, in the forest or around your house, the best way to find a bird is to listen. You'll hear them rustling or you'll hear them singing. They, their songs have really dropped off. Um, there's not nearly the amount of verbalization by birds. So you're looking for movement. You're looking for um places where they might be, and you're also listening. One of the things that uh, you can try is not looking so much for them, but just like be aware of your peripheral vision. So I can see my fingers here. So if the kids are out, have them just kind of sit and look and then wait for something to move and catch their eye. And if you can do it, a good pair of binoculars will help. I, a trick I use, and this is really silly, and I don't, I don't know if it'll work for you, but I will pretend I've got a pair of binoculars, and I will do this. Now, it does a couple of things. Obviously, there's no magnification. I'm not that stupid, but it, what it does is it cuts out the light coming in, and it tends to focus me. And so I'm now looking in this particular area rather than the whole thing. So if I hear a sound, sometimes I'll, I'll do that. Uh, and it does help. Uh, it, it helps me spot animals. Uh, but the best thing to rely on is your hearing and just that sense of motion. And, and what is really surprising, if you're really into birds, you want to go down to Long Point sometime in the next uh, couple of weeks, probably next month and see if there's swans down there, or better yet, go down in March when they are migrating back up and you go to a place called Elmer. You'll see these huge white birds that stand out against the blue sky. But if you watch them, it doesn't take long for that white bird just to disappear into the sky. It's amazing how well camouflaged a white bird against a blue sky can be. So the blue sky thing, you got me thinking. That was a good question. Uh, I don't know if I answered it. I don't think it's a silver bullet answer by any means. No, but but now we know that if we see a, a group of kids at Riverwood like walking around doing this, then we will have known uh, who was uh, responsible for that. Uh, and I think another question coming from the class uh, along the lines of what we were talking about today: What type of animal is closest to extinction? So, uh, what what sort of animals are we dealing with right now that are uh, not doing so well because of the, you know, the the situation with the environment, and I imagine because of climate change. Just about any type of rhinoceros is really in trouble, not because of climate change, but because uh, people want its horn uh, for medical reasons. Um, many of the predators in Africa, the wild dog in particular, but even lions are declining outside of national parks. Uh, so there, there are lots of animals, but most of the animals that are in greatest danger of extinction are animals you've never heard of, you've never seen. They're not giant pandas. They're not polar bears. They're not rhinoceroses. They're insects and other minuscule animals that are so important to the environment and to the ecosystem, but we don't think about them. And I think the estimate I saw from the World Wildlife Fund is there's something like a million animals that could go. And the trouble is that some of these animals we don't even know they exist. And they're going to disappear before we even got to study them. But the ones that excite us, the giant panda, the polar bear, those are the ones that people respond to. They're not going to respond to a six-inch worm. But that six-inch worm is just as important as the polar bear or the giant panda. Very much so, all part of the whole ecosystem. 
uh, that they're a part of. And uh, I think we'll get to one last question, uh, probably again coming from the class. And, and thanks to uh, Michelle for uh, showing this uh, video to her class and, and bringing all the questions to us. Uh, so, you know, we talked about forms of different uh, wildlife today. Uh, this one about toucan beaks in particular, which are really big, but if they only feed on fruit, why do they need such a big beak? I think it has to do more with their love life than their feeding. Um, I, I am not an expert on toucans, but I do know a little bit about puffins. And you, if you look at a picture of a, a puffin, you notice its beak is really bright red and it's huge. And you'll see pictures of them dangling about six fish out of them. Um, beak is handy, but they lose all that color as soon as they're finished their breeding season. So it has to do more with attracting a mate now, the toucans, to my knowledge, do not lose their beaks. I think um, there are probably other reasons around getting food, but I'm sure that part of it is to advertise to um, a male or a female toucan that, hey, I'm healthy, I have some success, I'm worthy to be your mate. Interesting question. Uh, and also worth keeping in mind that, you know, when you look at different forms of nature, they're not necessarily for... The purpose that you might think it is like in the case of a beak it's not necessarily just for feeding but uh for mating for other reasons yeah. Uh, so yeah really good questions uh thanks very much uh to michelle and her class for uh yeah. for submitting for watching and uh, submitting those questions today we do appreciate it That's and we appreciate everyone uh watching today i think that's uh, all that we have for this particular presentation but a reminder that we do have more understanding nature facebook live events coming up throughout the fall. So keep an eye on our Facebook page. Uh, the events listing there will have all the information. And for other events that we have coming up, including some in-person events at Riverwood, uh, like our Yoga for Nature event uh, that's starting next week on Tuesday, September 29th, uh, head over to our website, theriverwoodconservancy.org. You can have a look at all of the events, both virtual and in-person that we have coming up. And if you have the financial means, we Always appreciate your support through donations. Again, you can make that on our website at the riverwoodconservancy.org. So Dave, thank you again for another excellent presentation. Any parting words for today? Uh, get out and enjoy nature. It is wonderful. And if you live in Mississauga or in the GTA, you don't have to go very far to find nature. So get out, come to Riverwood. But if you can't come to Riverwood, take a walk in your park and enjoy it. It's wonderful. And watch those turkey vultures. <laughs> thank you for joining us. Good advice as always. Thanks again, Dave. Uh, thanks to everyone for joining us. Uh, we will talk to you soon. In the meantime, please stay safe. Bye-bye all.